Hello, hello. Hey, everybody. How's everyone doing? So at Collision, I'm sure you've heard a lot about generative AI. <laughs> uh, hopefully, you've had enough, because today we're going to talk a little bit about robots, robots that actually do shit, right? Yep. Um, so yeah, so Tessa, Scott, why don't you introduce yourselves? Tell us what your robots actually do um, and why you think they're going to change the world. Oh, all right. Want me to start? Please. I'm Tessa Lau, CEO and co-founder at Dusty Robotics. Uh, Dusty builds robots for the modern construction workforce. Uh, what that means is that uh, we build the robots that build the world. So our field printer robot is uh, the most accurate mobile robot on the planet. What it does is it takes building models and it uh, digital building models, so the software that it draws the, the design of your building, and it prints with ink on the floor exactly what's going to go where. So it's printing your digital blueprint on the floor, and this is replacing people who would typically be on their hands and knees using measuring tape and string to dimension out those buildings. I'm Scott Gravel, CEO, founder of Atabotics. We decided that we wanted to create a digital transformation of modern commerce supply chain, um, but I didn't have any original ideas, so I just ripped off ants. <laughs> and we emulate the way successful natural systems create efficiency by taking supply chain and warehousing logistics and turning it into a three-dimensional matrix versus a two-dimensional one um, that human beings exist in. We walk on the ground, we drive on the ground, we walk in hallways, but leaf cutter ants exist in highly successful natural systems by utilizing the entire three dimensions. So we took inspiration from that and ripped it off blatantly, and I'm thrilled that they don't have a copyright attorney. <laughs> I don't think ants know how to copyright anything. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's probably good for your business, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the competition is nature, so we just try to copy it as best we can. Okay, so both of you are in hardware. Uh, hardware is very hard, as they say. Uh, it's definitely difficult, especially in today's climate. Can you talk a little bit about the climate today and you know, making sure costs are, are there? Maybe uh, Tessa? Yeah, so, I mean, hardware is hard. We've heard this multiple times today throughout this conference. Um, and what I was saying earlier today is that one of the reasons it's hard is because you only have a couple chances at bat, right? If you're venture-backed, you've got a limited pot of money in which to prove out your idea. And with that limited time and resources, you have to figure it out. And you have to figure it out pretty fast. And so one of the challenges to building a hardware startup is how do you prototype and iterate all with an eye towards building something that customers actually want, even though you can't take a lot of chances um, because the lead time for parts and the lead time for development and building is actually pretty long in hardware compared to software. The other thing that we've focused on is because we are interacting in the real world and we're around people, um, software can't break your hand. Right. So there's serious safety concerns. Yeah. So not only do you got to get it right, it's got to be safe and it's got to bring value. Um, and what we found is in developing our system that you can create a lot of different test environments, but you can't push the pause button on gravity. Um, so if only that that idea that you know break shit fast, you know, has a new i you know a new kind of quantum when it's a really loud noise in the shop, versus just something that doesn't work. And being kind of brave and courageous enough to charge into hardware, you got to be willing to break it to make it work. And um, that kind of goes against typical engineering methodologies. And you know, like if they want it all safe and perfect. But yep. in hardware, you gotta, you've got to be willing to like, make some sparks in your lab so you don't make them in your customer site. Yeah, and then just iterate. And yeah. then that speed to market, as Tessa mentioned, is everyone has expectations that if you're delivering technology now, you're delivering it in the kind of this comparison model to the, like, developing software, a SaaS platform, or a website. Right. Whereas getting the parts, building real things, testing real things does take time. So there is that kind of added acceleration in hardware. It's not that it's hard, it's just different, but we've got to compare it to, to the right things. I think you have to, there's a tightrope that you have to walk. On the one hand, you want to move fast and break things and you know, really figure things out as fast as you can. On the other hand, if what you're solving 
is a critical path task, which is what it is in construction for us, and your robot is being used to build a building, and if your robot breaks down, then that building is going to take longer and cost millions of dollars extra. Right. That's all on you. Yeah. So you yeah. can't break things. Yeah. And so how do you I'll, move fast? I'll, I'll argue things? with you. You can never break things in front of the customer, but you can break <laughs> as much as you can in the lab. Yes, oh, we broke things, things in front of customers. <laughs> yeah, we have We survived. We have too, but. So you want to break things early and get out the kinks. Yes. So that you don't lose a customer because you broke things. And hopefully it didn't break a person. <laughs> Part of it is like finding the right customers early yeah. who are willing to see you break things. Right. And, and tolerate that and move on, move forward with you. Right, because you do need some funding, of course. Yeah. So could you actually talk about some of the technical challenges, maybe one technical challenge that you've experienced in the past and one that you're working on now to try to overcome? Um, so the best story that I have about technical challenges. Um, is this the fridge story? This is the first story. Okay. I, it's I'm a many. good one. It's, it's a good one. If, if you read my Twitter feed, you'll, you'll have seen this story. So about a year and a half ago, uh, winter 2021, I think, uh, we had a rash of robot failures. Um, and uh, we would take robots out in the world, and they would... Uh, not, they would behave unpredictably, let's just say. And, you know, we, we worked on it, we worked on it, we identified the root causes, uh, we found a couple different root causes, we fixed all of those things. You know, a couple months later, everything was working great. Uh, then the next winter comes around, and the robots start failing again in the <laughs> same way. And it turns out that we actually hadn't fixed the problem. It was temperature dependent. Uh. It turns out that when the temperature gets below a certain level, some of our parts behaved unpredictably. They just don't want to, the robots don't want to work in the winter. Yeah, it's they don't like working right? in the winter. <laughs> exactly. They're, they're kind of lazy that way. <laughs> and so we discovered that even though we thought we'd fixed the problem, uh, it wasn't actually the, the spring had fixed the problem, right? The, the winter had warmed up, mm. and so that's what we thought fixed the problem. And so we had to go through a whole year's cycle in order to actually identify and triage the problem. The way we actually finally found the problem was we put robots in the fridge, and when we took them out, they were misbehaving. What about you, Scott? Putting any robots in the fridge? Yes. Actually, we are. <laughs> lots of robots in fridges. Actually, freezers right now. Okay. Our value proposition is to reduce the volume needed for storage and retrieval to about 15% of the typical floor plate required. And so the green energy um, kind of initiative of reducing cold chain storage has led us to actually developing environmental test chambers for robots to develop freezer variants. And freezer is hard. It's really hard. Um, so that's kind of one of the current challenges. The, the, the evolution in our business has been interesting. Some of the first challenges were technical. Like dissimilar materials rubbing against each other create a lot of static electricity. And big blue sparks would jump from the robot to the structure and short out the computer system. Now the biggest challenges we're trying to face in robotics is is creating efficient, error-free interaction between robots and people. So that long tail of exception handling, you know, I never thought that I have to develop a system that had to instantly retrieve a bin because someone left their cell phone in it. <laughs> or like a barcode scanner, like a wireless handheld barcode scanner, super convenient, yeah. unless the robot takes it away. <laughs> and then they can't do anything until the robot brings it back. Right. So it went from technical, like physics, electronics, mechatronics, controls challenges, now to how do you create error-free interaction between automation and people? And that's been kind of the biggest flip in our challenges. The robots work great, they do what we ask them to do, but getting error-free interaction with people now is our biggest, certainly, and, and trying to get them out of the freezer, so. <laughs> Could you talk, maybe tell the audience, the both of you, a little bit about how you see what's current, what your, what Dusty Robotics and Atabotics are, how they're impacting their respective industries, so construction and supply chain, and where you see each of those respective industries in the, say, next 10 years? Yeah, so construction's really interesting. Um, I mean, we all live and touch products of the construction industry every single day. When you're gonna go home tonight, this building that we're living in right now, these are all products of the construction industry, and the problem with construction is that it's inefficient, it hasn't adopted technology in, in decades, and, um, and the workforce is shrinking. You know, construction people are retiring, it's a hard job, and no one wants to do it. And so all of that is leading towards this crisis. Um, I heard that Toronto has to build 1.5 million new homes in the next 10 years in order to house the population here, and you can't do that if you don't have the people to actually do the work. And so what we're seeing in, in, at Dusty is that robotics are actually um, uh, being embraced inside of construction because they're a way to solve all of these problems that help our customers reduce their risk, 
uh, be more efficient and solve their labor problems. I want to build on what you said because supply chain, some of the biggest challenges is labor market, but the biggest problem is you. Because all of your expectations in supply chain have dramatically shifted over the last decade. You were fine going to the store, limited selection, picking out your item, paying for it, bringing it home yourself. Now your expectation is you will have a much expanded broad selection of product at a lower price that will get delivered to your door and you're more likely to buy it if you get it tomorrow. So we have the labor constraints, real estate constraints, technology constraints, but really it's market expectation now that's driving the adoption of our technology. So we built it to try to put all of these goods closer to you. Because the closer they are to you in a distributed network, the less fuel, the less time, the less impact, the less cost it has. And this is what we're pushing towards to getting the market more competitive. Because we're seeing all the same problems as construction. The only difference is I think in construction, people aren't expecting their house in a week any, anymore. They still <laughs> understand it's going to take nine months. But in supply chain, you guys are what's driving the change. Um, for a technology adoption to address all of these concerns, yet meet your needs and requirements. What about, what about could we t pivot a little bit to uh, human, human, well, human and robot interaction in the actual fields that your robots are working? I'm assuming it's safer for the robot to do its thing and then yeah. for the humans to come in. Do you see that changing over time? Do you see robots and humans working alongside each other? Yeah, so our robot is what we call semi-autonomous. Yeah. So someone sets it up, uh, programs it, and then lets it go and do its thing. When we started, I was thinking that we were going to build a fully autonomous system. You'd set it up, leave it overnight, and come back in the morning, and the job was done. And when we started talking to construction people, we realized that that's not exactly what they want. Um, and so right now, the way our system works is, is designed for a reason. It's designed because construction people are way smarter than robots are ever going to be. And they know what their site looks like. They know what the constraints are. They know what needs to be done in one sequence. They're coordinating with all the other people on a job site. On some of the most congested sites I've been on, it's like 2,000 people all walking around on a site together trying to do their work. And when the site's that congested, you can't just set a robot down and have it do its thing. It's a really complex problem of negotiation, coordination, collaboration. And that's where the people come in. And so the, the way people are learning how to use our system is to uh, learn its, its quirks and where it can work really fast and where it needs special handling, and then use that knowledge to actually get the most efficiency out of the system they can. We, we've taken a kind of a similar approach as how do you work with people. The robots themselves exist in an environment where I don't want people in, because that's what creates efficiency. But that interaction, that handoff point between people and machine, we try to make that job the most human we can. We ask the robots to do the stuff that isn't good for people, like you do. You're like, you don't want people crawling around with knee pads on the floor with a chalk. Yep. We, we don't want people pushing stuff up and down aisles, carrying heavy things. The most human job is the problem solving, the, the spatial analysis. So by allowing the robots to do the heavy lifting, in essence, and allowing people to do the creative, more human tasks, we find that finding that separation point um, is ideal. I don't want a person in our system moving stuff around. That's right. a robot's job. Just like I don't want a robot figuring out what's the best way to pack the three things you just ordered in a box. That's a very human job. You know? For now. So separating them and finding that, that tie-off. I think it's going to be a long time before we ever make a robot that can do what we do. But you said construction workers are incredibly smart. I can't, I can't find a robot in the world that can pick up a 45-pound weightlifting plate and a sewing needle. <laughs> but everybody in this room can do that. Robots need to be specialized at a task that they're well suited to. And when you try to make the Swiss Army knife of technology, it usually means you're not doing anything well. So focus on what automation can do really well and free up people so they can do more of what they do best and do more of it to create value in that interaction. That's why I don't believe humanoid robotics are ever going to really take off because they're not specialized enough. They're trying to solve too many problems at once. So you think humanoid robots are just going to be in science fiction forever? Totally. People love them, but you know, they're, they're, they're the stuff of movies rather than the stuff of actually doing shit in the real world. Yeah, exactly.
<laughs> yeah, like my robot, I don't think yours either does a backflip unless something's really going sideways. <laughs> I don't we, think it would be even physically capable, right? Because it's not built for that. Unless have. something's really going sideways. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, so you have some back lips. <laughs> Same here. So uh, that actually ties into my next question. What are your stances on human employment going forward, given you're both, you've both alluded to robots are not going to take away any, any jobs, but they are going to displace some work. So I'm curious what your stances are. I mean, I actually do think robots are taking jobs. Okay. Um, but they're taking the jobs that people don't want. Um, so, you know, in construction, the, the lowest wor level workers are the ones with the hardest jobs in some cases, but not in all cases. Uh, in, in the case of the, ro of the work that Dusty does, uh, layout is actually done by the foreman. He's the highest paid worker on the job site. He's the most senior, the most experienced. So and wouldn't, wouldn't that be a job that they want to keep as yes, opposed to one he would that absolutely. He, so what, what Dusty does is he takes away that nasty, yucky part of that foreman's job and he gives that foreman more time to actually do the work that he really wants to do, which is the coordination, the collaboration, the communication with all the other people on the, the site. Human, the human part of his job. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, I'm going to contradict you a little bit in that robots are taking jobs. Absolutely. But it's not taking jobs in the phys physical world. If you are a knowledge worker, think about call centers, think about the move with now ChatGPT, in writing and content creation, think about accounting, think about um, legal aids, researchers, any, any knowledge worker, you could say robotics and automation is starting to displace those jobs. In the world we live in, we just take the most inhuman jobs to address the labor constraint to allow people to do more to create value. And if you think about in construction, labor constraint. In supply chain, there's labor constraints. But let's not kid ourselves. Robots are taking jobs. But they're it, taking the jobs that people aren't good at and don't want. Or the ones that are really easy to automate purely with bits and not with atoms. Because yeah. back to the point, hardware is hard. So this idea that you know we're here because we're talking about robots in the real world that actually exist out there and do shit. Um, we're finding that we're both creating more opportunities for employment. Every job I've ever done has created efficiency, but also created jobs in that piece of real estate. Um, but automation still is going to displace. It's just don't be afraid of the ones that are mowing your lawn. <laughs> you know, um, be afraid of the ones that are answering your phone calls and, and, and doing all of your document research. Not necessarily to be afraid, but I think it's naive to say that robots don't displace we're just taking the really the ugliest jobs that that historically have been the hardest to do and we're trying to make it simpler to free up humans to do more value-added work so but we're also creating new jobs too absolutely right? one of the things I'm most proud of is that there's a new role in carpentry now that's robot operator yep and there are people who are being trained up to use dusty robots and that's all they do and that's their job and they love it it's something they get to be really proud of yeah we we've done something similar we have a role that we couldn't find a hire for, which was robot mechanic. You have to understand hardware, sensors, comms, mechatronics, controls, and those were always kind of disparate industries, but now in automation, it's all combined. And so finding someone that could go into the field to service something or support this technology, not just beyond operator now, but actually, and there's, there's tie-ins to this into mining when you're looking at like autonomous vehicles or aviation. If you think your pilot flew your plane most of the way here, you're a little naive. That was a robot flying it. But that integration of technologies now, we're seeing we're developing more and more skill sets and careers around that. Yeah. All right, well, so you heard it here first. Robot operator, robot mechanic, that's what you need to tell your kids to study. Absolutely. Because those will, jobs will still be there in the future. Totally. Uh, or data science. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's many, there are many yeah. options. All right, well, I, think, I see we're at time. So please, please join me in thanking Tessa and Scott. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Everyone. Appreciate it.